Three, what? <laughs> okay. So what we talked about um, was actually the end of the last meeting. Uh, Tyler was thinking of doing some kind of recap of what's going on in information security. So what I did was over the last 30 days just kind of kept an eye out for things that I thought would be interesting and generate some kind of discussion among people here. So that means, for, okay, for every one of these slides you're going to see the headline, you're going to see a couple of bullet points on recapping what it actually said, and then there's going to be questions. And I'll go through the questions, and if nobody responds, I'm going to start picking people that I know, and after I get run out of those people, I'm going to pick people I don't know. So if there's absolutely no, you know, interaction, then I will, you know, volunteer people. But, uh, yeah, so what I did was just kind of went through things that, yeah, I could sit there and go through, you know, what was the Microsoft, you know, vulnerability bulletin for this month, and go through every single exploit, and know, at some point it becomes nauseous. So <laughs> I, had, I figured I'd go with things that would not only generate discussion, but kind of were underlying topics that are discussed a lot within security. So that was kind of my, my uh, idea behind it. There's about 10 stories in here that we're going to go through. And uh, if you guys don't help out, you're going to be out here in about six and a half minutes. But, you know, um, so the first one that I thought was kind of interesting was this gentleman here actually, well, got into a lot of hotel rooms. <laughs> he used a, an Arduino controller to more or less read from memory in this key lock, okay? And there was this 32-bit key within it that was stored in memory, and there's a port on the bottom of these, the, the, uh, the locks that are exploited were called Onity. I'd never heard of them myself, but I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, so there's a port on the bottom that actually charges the battery in it if it were to run low and someone can't get into their room. So what he did was he basically made himself a controller that plugged into the bottom of this thing and read from memory within the door lock. And once you played that back to the, the lock itself, it just green light and everything was open. So this like is <coughs> affects something, they said 4 million hotel rooms, I'm not entirely, I think that is them speculating on Onity's customer base. But it's still a lot of hotel rooms, and the way that the guy described it in the article, the, the gentleman who actually, I, I use the word gentleman loosely as you see his picture, but um, <clears throat> uh, the way he described it, he said it was stupid simple to get into this stuff and was surprised that no one had done it before. So as I was kind of reading through this, I was thinking, one of the things that I find a lot when I, when I go to deal with um, Obviously, I work for Hurricane, and we do like consulting, so I see a lot of different customers, a lot of different people. And um, one of the things that I hear a lot, and, and when it, this is obviously a lot when it, hardware hacking is brought up, but is that it isn't really relevant within a you know, corporate environment. And while this, you know, if you are a insurance company, you may not care a lot about this, but you take that and you kind of extrapolate it along different businesses, people who make widgets and parts and stuff like that, then it actually becomes something that people have to worry about, at least in my opinion, for you know, those companies that actually make stuff. So the questions that I had is, well, one, obviously it was relevant for Onity, and two, have you guys like run into this stuff at all? Like security people, you know, you have a job to do, you have your your time clock that you punch, and you know, working on breadboards and stuff like that while you're at work, people aren't necessarily like, they're looking at you like, what are you doing? What does this actually have to do with your job? Anybody run into that stuff? Is anybody big into hardware hacking that actually finds it useful in their job? Anybody? You don't have to raise your hand, just totally talk. <laughs> well, I mean, no one else is No, it's fine, go. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I work at a manufacturing company, so uh, a lot of times we, we get into the hardware hacking side of things because we have direct access to all of this, to all these hardware, all these different ports that are on the system. We have no idea what's going on on there, so for us, the only way for us to really find out is to just kind of start plugging things in and seeing what we get. You know, uh, we do some USB uh, protocol analysis, trying to figure stuff out from there. Uh, 
we did a lot of the Arduino stuff early on because we found out it actually affected our our products uh, because we found out that if we put in an Arduino into the USB port, we could emulate devices that weren't supposed to be plugged in at all, uh, specifically like keyboards and mice and stuff like that. Uh, and then we found out that we could do even more stuff, you know, thought things that were being blocked weren't being blocked. Um, I read more about this particular example here, and what's interesting about this guy is that he tested in his lab, and it worked fine on the, the one door, the one thing he had. But then when he actually went to go test it in a hotel, he found out that he had a success rate of about maybe 50%. So he found out that it didn't work nearly as well as he expected. Um, but you know, there's a big concern there, though, that he was able to still get into about half the rooms he tried in a given hotel. So what does that mean for you know any company really that has corporate people that are traveling on a regular basis? You know, what type of information are you leaving in your room that now some random kid can just plug into the bottom of the key and get into your room and access your belongings in there? Yeah, you're given a safe in some of these hotels, but not all of them. And how many people really use that safe in there? Um, but you, you mentioned progressive insurance. I mean, as an insurance company, that would scare the life out of me to find out that, you know, I might be issuing insurance policies for a hotel that are using these locks, that now people can access this, these rooms without the proper controls in place. There's, this was a really interesting find on his part. Um, and he, he was looking at something that, you know, quite frankly, people have been looking at the cards themselves and how to break the, the cards and the data that's on there and how to replicate that. But they never thought about actually looking at the device until he did. Can I just quickly say, I watched a talk a while ago, and I don't remember who did it or where I watched it. But it was about the actual cards, um, using a card reader, and writer. Um, and apparently, all you have to do is change is either two or four digits on them, and you get access to every uh, door in the place. Um, they're only controlled by like four digits on the card itself. And in respect to that, I mean, how easy is it to go up to the maid, right, who leaves the card on her little thing, and just swipe it, clone it? And you still have access to everything, so you don't even need to use this. I mean, Honestly, like if this wasn't to work, mm -hmm. I mean, I just go to the main myself anyway because it'd be so much easier just to call on a car. What's nice about this one though is that you don't even have to have oh, access yeah. to this card in your right. scenario. You have to have that initial access to a card. Right. But so if you don't even, if you're not even staying at that particular right. hotel, you don't have a key card from there. Right. You can still go in. You just check it, take a look real fast because everyone's allowed to walk in and walk the halls. Right. You see that they're using that. Plug in. I uh, kick into this one keep working down the line until you find one that you can, and then boom, you're in. Well, the one nice thing about the cards is if you think about it, like say uh, Hilton or Red Roof or whatever hotel you choose, right, their cards are pretty much all the same. So if you have one of their cards, right, and you figure out how to get access to all the rooms just by changing those numbers, you have access to the entire hotel chain. Yeah, you have well, you, know, you wouldn't have access to the entire hotel chain? Well, not, maybe not because all of it. Because you probably they're, have they're access. Different. different. We do some access. We do a lot of access control where I work at as well then you would have access probably to the site, and that's about it. Uh, because then you'd have to figure out the, the scheme for the next site. Uh, because it's all based on, a lot of these things are broken down by sites, and you might even find if the, if the area that you're in is large enough, they have, might have multiple sites within one location. So you, you need to kind of find like a MasterCard, or a, uh, not a MasterCard, but a, you know, the master lock key for yeah. everything. Right. Um, so that's you know, the one problem where this, you're going off the key that's already embedded into the into the device, into the card reader itself, and then you're breaking into all the rooms or afterwards. This is all great discussion, um, but I just want to add a point to this. Speaking from the lock sport perspective, you know, we learned very quickly in lock sport yes. that locks generally aren't great security mechanisms. They're deterrent. They're deterrent, and um, you shouldn't ever just leave your valuables inside a hotel room unsecured um, you, you mentioned the safes. There are many attacks for, uh, against a lot of those electronic safes, too. There are default codes for some models of those safes. Yeah, so um, the hotel has an override key for those safes in case you forget your combination. So there's lots of ways to get into those safes. Um, best thing to do is just use layered security like you do with your networks. You know, Absolutely. Use a cable lock if you're leaving your stuff in your room. Turn your TV up real loud and put your uh, privacy thing out there and hope nobody breaches that. 
And, and another, unfortunately, this affects the physical security uh, area more than it affects like information security. But physical security are very used to. You've always you, you've gone with a specific vendor. They lock you in and try to keep you sticking with the same vendor for a very long time. And they're so they're not. They say they're security companies, but they're not security companies. They're manufacturing companies. So they tend to stick with one process, and they don't want to change it. So even though they might have added a new piece of technology to it, it's not better technology. It's not improving the security. It's just the next keyword that they need to have on their promotional items. So that way, you want to you know stick with them. Because um, you uh, you mentioned how they have the you know you change the pin or you change the number on there. A lot of companies will use the same type of card and the same brand of card, right. but will change the the schema of the card just enough that now that that one and zero that you were changing the first time is now in a different location. Even though it's the same manufacturer of the card and everything else like that, that's what they do to try to keep you in, ingrained and to try to stick with the same vendor. Uh, security companies are slowly, you know, learning that they can't do this as more uh, information like this comes out. Where you know they are, they've embedded this new technology in there. Well, the technology that you know the information security people have been playing with and busting and breaking for years. You know, for Microsoft and all the other companies have felt our wrath for so long. You know, now the physical security companies are starting to feel that same wrath from the from the uh, hackers and the group people. Yeah, uh, I just want to say that uh, if you guys are really interested. Card decrypting thing. I think this is the topic we were talking about. Uh, at B -Shot, B -Shot Rochester, those are the guys that gave a great talk about um, only changing a couple digits and uh, being able to get access to a entire oh. state and decrypting the card. Did he also do the thing about the coat hanger? Because I remember that. You just go underneath the door with the coat hanger and pull the lock. And it's just yeah, there's lots of attacks in the hotel room doors. B said what? Rochester. Well, yeah, actually, what I, and while all that was interesting, what, what I actually found really interesting was the gentleman there actually has hardware hacking as part of his job, and it's seen as something that is useful to the company. That is, that is at least in my experience, maybe that's not actually factual, but it's rare from what yeah, I can Yeah, two, what I two can years talk. ago, when we, when we first tried it, uh, they kind of looked at us funny. <laughs> like, what are you guys doing? And then once we showed our proof of concepts and showed what we can do with, and we did it with Arduino, Arduinos, um, once we showed what we could do with these, and they were forward that we were able to get around their security controls. So they just they didn't think that that was even possible. So they started to take more, uh, you know, they started to give us more credit for what we were doing, and started looking at us, being like, okay, you guys are actually providing value. Well, that's pretty cool. Yeah, because you see a lot of consulting companies, a lot of pen testers, a lot of stuff like that. They have license to do it because it's part of the service they're providing to a company. But internal security departments don't really spend a lot of time working on that stuff when probably actually pretty useful. So that, yeah. that's kind of what I found interesting. Yeah, especially any company that does manufacturing of those type of devices, of, of any, any you know, logical boards that, you know, they, they need to start looking at that. They need to give it to, you know, people to have them do actual assessments of them. Because, I mean, you've got, just because you put a piece of plastic over top of your header pins to access your your processor doesn't mean that someone's not going to come in there with their dermal tool, cut that off, and plug into it. Uh, you know, the hardware hacking is just, it's, it's almost trivial for some people yeah. because of how just easy these companies have made it. No, that's good, good stuff. You guys discussed it, I'm so happy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, if you have two layers of plastic, I mean, you're doing better on security. <laughs> <laughs> you got your layers. <laughs> And not that I'm following up on and not that I'm following up on what Dave said, but you sound pretty knowledgeable in it. If you wanted to talk about it, I mean, <laughs> saying <laughs> I, I, I talked about it a year and a half ago. <laughs> oh, did you? So the next story I came across was a surrounding breach notification, and breach notification isn't necessarily super interesting, maybe to everybody in this room, but. What I did find interesting was that if you've ever if you've ever worked in a situation where you actually have to report things, um, there's a real fine line between yeah this happened and it was bad and hey we have to tell somebody. 
And so I, I was kind of reading through this article, and, and they were talking about, you know, work with law enforcement, you know, it'll make it better if you tell if you tell people about it, instead of trying to hide it, you'll have, you know, less reputation loss and stuff like that. They never actually talked about, you know, losing money, losing, you know, actual information. It was all kind of high level stuff about whether or not you should, you know, report it to law enforcement and be very, very open about it. And, and what I found interesting about that is, yeah, it's really easy for, for law enforcement to say, and I'm not, you know, knocking the FBI or the cops, or in this case, I think it was uh, AFP or someplace, not some some police agency in Australia. But um, it's very easy for them to say, hey, work with us. It's a whole other story when you're on the other end of that, and you've got a board of directors that says, I am not telling a soul what just happened here. So I, I kind of thought about that, like. What, when, when do you think like the breach is really ne the breach breach report is really necessary? Is it when you know for a fact that customer data leak? Yeah, that's probably it. But what about if use just usernames got out? Or what about you know if uh, somebody's just somebody's name got out? You know, there's there's a lot of different layers to this stuff as you start to look through it, and you realize at what point does it you know really need do you really need to tell somebody? So that was kind of why I picked on this. Um, but the uh, the one that I thought was a little more uh, applicable to the people here is you're going. None of us are on the board of have anything, you know, <laughs> and, and none of us are making the decisions of whether or not we actually have to report it. What happens when you're sitting there and you you know for a fact that this information leaked and you know for a fact that the board, that your company isn't reporting it? What responsibility is it? If, is it at your point? You know, like consultants, it's a little different because you have NDAs in place and you have all this stuff where you can't tell anybody. But Depends on how much my retirement fund and stuff. <laughs> <options laughs> I have. Yeah, no, you know, you're not going to keep your job over this. But you know, what's your responsibility as a security administrator? You know, when or as an engineer or an analyst or whatever you have, given that you have inside information as to what actually leaked out, you know? What, what's your responsibility at that point? Anybody? I'll even take an opinion at this point. You well, know, I think most, most um, breach reports are required by regulation or yeah. the law, and there are very specific or relatively specific terms for that. I know in some cases it's gray area. <laughs> um, yeah. So. I don't know. I mean, it probably comes back to what you can do and still sleep with them. If you watch somebody not disclose a breach to a gambling site, say, that's not really going to bother you on a moral level. Mm -hmm. If you find out that a hospital leaked a ton of essential data that's going to have lives hanging in the balance, there's certain points where you would have to make. Like that one, it would be like, you know, I have to disclose this so that something is brought to this so that it doesn't happen to these poor people. Or, I just can't continue to work for an environment that's going to support hiding things of that nature. I mean, I just I think that any time more than like I mean, if it's not like a critical box or something, any time that somebody's exploited more than one box, I mean, I think somebody should be covered. Like, I mean, if, if it's just one box and it's like something critical, then obviously yeah. But I mean, if it's just you know, if you can just take care of the problem just by like you know, loading the OS, they haven't got any further past that, no critical information. I don't think that's necessary. Anything more than that, I think it'd be necessary. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, is, from personal experience, I mean, I found a lot of vulnerabilities in different companies, and I just had no idea. You know, who do you, who do you report that stuff to, and and how do you report it responsibly without action? I mean, if I just say, hey, listen, I can log into your open access point, and I'll have access to everything, right? They're not going to care about that. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm not going to go in and log into their open access point and group every single one of their boxes, and then go, hey, listen. <laughs> Look what I just did. You know, I mean, they would, they, that would get their attention, right? But that's, I mean, that's like pretty legal, I think. You know, even though you are, <laughs> 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 right? Even though, but I mean, that might be the only way they ever get that fixed. You know, I mean, just telling them, hey, I can do this. It's not going to change. Yeah, you're you're you're, you're, you're delving into something that's <laughs> right. No, but I'm just saying, I can real dicey. <laughs> right. No, but but I mean, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, yeah, you can report it, but reporting it. It's not going to change the problem unless they know there's a serious problem, mm -hmm. right? And how do you, you know, get their attention to say, look, this you really have to fix this, otherwise, 
Well, I mean, we screw them a lot. I, I see that problem all the time. I mean, people report things to people, but they report things to our security administration folk. Our security administration folk provision user IDs, and they're telling people about a hole on the website. And, like, they have no idea who to report to. They don't know. So, but on the other side, they thought they reported it to security. You know, I told someone in security, you know, Mm -hmm. it's, it's a two-way street, you know, you gotta, you gotta find the right person to report it to, you gotta escalate, you know, if someone's not, you know, you said you went to the first security person, they're not doing anything, you escalate to their manager, you escalate up, you, eventually you get to either a CSO, a CISO, or a CIO, and if they're not reporting anything, nine times out of ten, a company's got a board of ethics, or some place that you can report anonymously to, come to things, and you report to those, I guarantee you, that those people will start to get the ball rolling on something that happened. So if you find, if you come to my company, you found an open access point, and you were like, oh my god, I can see file shares on there, and I can see your financial right. information, you report that to okay, no, no security guy. I'll, I'll keep running, I'm gonna run you over, but uh, it, because you just spawned a great idea. Don't even bother with the ethics board if you've already tried to contact the company. Um, Yahoo Finance has boards for all public traded companies. Start blasting that, and the shareholders get pissed and hurt. <laughs> that. <laughs> one of the one of that actually. Uh, one right. of the things that I found. Can, that can oh, be ahead. kind of. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, that that can be kind of bad, and, but absolutely, if it's a publicly traded company, I mean, at the end of the day, the people that own the company are the shareholders. You know, so if even if the board of you know their ethics board doesn't want to take care of the issue, you know informing the shareholders that there is an issue, but at the same time, you know, how do you know that you you found something that you thought was the worst thing ever, and their security team looked at it, and they're like, there's nothing there. You, great, you found it's a, a call, right, it's, it's a judgment call, but how do, you, how do you know that? You know, you're like, I found cross-site scripting on this website, oh my god, this is horrible, and it's a website that has no way to do, you know, the cross-site scripting does nothing on that website. I'm not saying cross-site scripting is bad in general. You're going to base it on the thing. I mean, if you're losing medical records, you're losing social security numbers. Those have, you have federal, or you have, like you said, regula regulations that you have to report that stuff. Mm -hmm. If you don't report that stuff, you can be fined, you can go to jail, all sorts of stuff like that. So if you're a publicly traded company, you your financial information gets out, you know, things like that, you can, there's SOCs that go to SOCs, the GOBA, there's yeah. Yeah, the you, governing you agencies. Lose, of the you lose health information about people, uh, public health, or whatever it's called, I forget. Right? HIPAA. Yeah. Yeah. You, you have HIPAA to go against. So you have these you know, recourses that you can have for it. But at the same time, if you find a company's usernames on the internet, you think that's a breach. You know, that might not be a breach. Most yeah. people have their usernames or their email addresses. And you find the email addresses on the internet already. So it's, you know, it's, you have to put in perspective of the company that you're dealing with, the security of their company. You know, not every company is Fort Knox. You might deal with a manufacturer, a private manufacturing company who just doesn't care about anything. And then act it. You know, or if it's a public company that deals with fi uh, health information and financial information, that they have to care about the records that they have. And if they don't, it's, you know, the laws can, you know, are used against them if they don't. They're, huge fines and stuff like that. It's all dependent on the company. One of the things that I found, and, and this is strictly from an internal employee standpoint, was that for publicly traded companies, the uh, the governing agency, the SOX, that you know handles all that stuff that you have to be compliant with, actually has an OMS, um, I can't, can never say this word, OMS um, 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 Budsman, that you can report to, and you know do so confidentiality and actually Maybe in some cases keep your job. So I mean, <laughs> there are there are you know recourses for you as, as somebody who works at this company if you see something going on. Um, I had a story relayed to me about a uh, uh, about a healthcare provider that um, was breached pretty badly, and the decision came down from on high that they weren't going to report it. And it caused a huge stir internally. People were just not not happy. The internal people really felt like they were being done a disservice because, you know, granted, you know, yeah, it was their stuff that got breached, but they were working hard to keep the stuff, whatever. They had done a lot of forensics on it. They put a lot of work into finding exactly what left. 
and uh, and I know some people who just really felt like they had no recourse in, in what to do at that point. And so I kind of thought this was a little interesting in that, you know, what do, what do you do in that case? And, and granted, none of the opinions that you hear here are, you know, you should go do this stuff. This is just a talking point to say, hey, you know, it, it kind of got me thinking when I read the article. I'm not telling you that you should go tell people, <laughs> tell whoever that you, right, whatever. <laughs> 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 but it, it is an interesting talking point. And these are the kind of things that, that I think we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis in security that you just don't really, you know, you, just, you don't talk about it because it's, at the end of the day, you know, am I going to lose my job? Does, does the guy sitting next to me actually give a crap? I mean, you know, it's just, you run across this stuff and you start, and you get the wheels start turning and you go, hmm, I wonder what I would do in that situation. Well, even as a, even as a company, I mean, if you know that you got breached, and I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a CISO, CISO, CIO, you know, I'm not on the board of directors, I'm not on that. I'm just an engineer. But, you know, as, but our stance has been if we know we've gotten breached and we've known that we've lost data that is, you know, critical, top secret, you know, personal information, we're going to come clean with it. We're going to admit that we lost the data because it's better to admit that you've lost the data, you've been breached, and that you are taking the proper actions to fix the issue than to try to ignore it, sweep it under the rug. Because what will happen is that you'll, you'll get ripped into, especially if you're a public company, you'll get ripped into by the media, you'll get ripped into by the public. By your user especially. base, by um, your shareholder, by everybody. Absolutely, I mean, there, you know, most companies don't go under if they suffer a breach. So you, know, you don't really need to worry about the company just completely dying because you've been breached and you've lost data. Um, it's, it's a risk of just doing business, you know, something's going to happen. But you need to come clean with it. You need to at least let let your let the people who are purchasing your products, your business partners, let them know that what's happened, what could have happened to their data. It, it's a much better alternative than to just sweep under the rug and think nothing ever happened. Right. Did you actually read this article? No. <laughs> because there was a... That's exactly what the whole point of the article was, and there was actually a, a they had two case studies in there, um, similar data breaches, similar sized companies, one hit it and ended up basically going out of business, where the other disclosed it and actually took a very minimal reputation hit and no loss of revenue. So it was kind of... Come on, look at TJ Maxx. Their revenue's gone up. Well, yeah. <laughs> All right, so the next one I ran across, I had to, I had to at least stop on, on Windows at some point. Um, so Trend Micro, and, and granted, this is coming from Trend Micro. So say what you will about whether or not they're good or they're bad, they're still doing research, they're still, they have, they have stake in the game here, okay, because they have a product that will install on Windows 8, okay? So they said that it's more secure than previous versions, which... I might buy given the amount of security development work that has gone into, well, from what I've read. Obviously, I'm not at Microsoft finding out what's going on. And the really what, crappy interface now. Oh, it's miserably ugly. I can't. The formerly known as Metro interface. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just tiles calling all the time. Oh, what, the tiles? Yeah, the tiles are in the front of it. Anyway, so there were three, three possible attack, there were three attack vectors that this particular um, that the researcher at Trend Micro found. Um, but he said that not all of them were readily exploitable. He said that you really, it's, a, it's totally a, a right place at the right time kind of vulnerability. And then you have to be able to bring it off. And he said it was kind of difficult. And that was what he was basing his, you know, synopsis that, you know, hey, Windows 8 is more secure than Windows 7 or previous versions. For me, it's more of a, how much do I really think that Microsoft is, getting in there and really trying to secure their product, I would actually think that, that, that there's quite a bit of, you know, development being done to keep this product secure given the black eyes that they take on a day-to-day -day basis. But at the same time, they're also going to push this thing to get out because, you know, the revenue from a, from a version upgrade, especially from a corporate standpoint, is ridiculous. I mean, they, they make money hand in the fist in some cases. And, uh, 
No. Did they actually go in the red one quarter this year? If they did, I don't know. Oh, did they? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I thought they actually went to the red. Does anybody here work there, Microsoft? The uh -oh. <laughs> Thank you for that. I hadn't thought about that. Just out of curiosity, does anybody here work for Apple? <laughs> Before I go to the next one. I'd like to work for Apple. I'm curious to know whether their new interface paradigm and all that opens previously non-existing vectors. Because they're changing how you interface mm -hmm. with the UI and with the system itself so much. I'm curious to see if the new things come out of it that weren't there at 7. And the way it's been described it's to me. It's an overlay. It's Windows Mobile on your screen. Yeah. 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 The first time I installed it, it took me like a half an hour to figure out how to shut the thing down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, it, 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 is it, is it, is it still a miss? What is the RTM? Just, when you first get in, just turn on your shutter, and you'll be okay. You back. Yeah, and scroll to the right. It's like an Android MSD. No, so yeah, the mobile interface in Windows 8, or the Windows Mobile and Windows 8 are practically identi identical from like when you first log on. That's the idea. Is they're trying to give you one interface to use across the board. Yeah, and, and Apple's doing the same thing. They're trying to do that oh, yeah. unified interface that goes across all their devices. And it's making OS X suck more and more every release. So. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I grudgingly did my Lion upgrade, and I mean, grudgingly. And now I'm sitting here staring at Mountain Lion because I've got stuff that just isn't working that is allegedly fixed in Mountain Lion, and I'm just done. Yeah, I'll go back to the But, whatever. So <laughs> but um, so my other question was how long I mean, is anybody actually talking Windows 8 in a corporate environment? End of life of Windows XP plus one year. <laughs> <laughs> QA environment this week? Yeah. Member of each QA team gets it, plus our admin staff. We're all getting it in the next, I don't know, we're supposed to download it today. So. How big is your company? Big the QA department. Yeah. Cool. So, so, how many, uh, I, don't, I don't know when it'll get past the QA department. IS though. I mean, we'll probably have it for long until a client has it. Somebody asks for it. I'll add that um, I, I know the BYOD things like a, kind of a joke, but it's some people really are pushing it. Um, on that note, and just just even the new devices coming out, I don't know if anyone's seen them. Um, I hope I'm not saying any NDA stuff, but. Some of these convertible tablets are pretty cool. They're coming out. They have one that the, the screen just pops right off, and it's like a surface. Like it just comes off. It's it's, it's heavier than an iPad 3 or something. But um, you're going to need Windows 8. So there, there's going to be a forcing factor, just like Apple and all the all, all with OS updates. If anyone has a large portion of OS X in their environment, they know. Well, if you don't want to upgrade the OS, you're stuck not buying hardware because Apple forces you by not even supporting the old hardware. Uh, this is the first time I think Windows is actually going to be able to do that because of these new ultra form, they call them uh, ultra tablets? Yeah, yeah. Ultra tab Are you talking tablet. about the Surface yeah, ultra, and, uh, specifically? But in this, no, the Surface is just Microsoft's, but there's these ultra tablets. Lenovo has a great line. They already have like, a yoga out, which like, pulls all of your, and they have the ultra board. They have one coming out. I don't know what it's. I, I saw some more attention, but this the screen just comes out. It's coming out this, this uh, obvious scene. I mean, yeah. it's a pretty sick stuff. So your, your keyboard's just a battery thing. And if you don't have 10 finger touch, which is the requirement of all, I mean, 10 finger touch on Windows 7 is not going to be needed. You don't want Windows 8. So. I'm just saying, if you, if you get those, those people, you know, the non IT people that want their fun, cool stuff, it's going to be a hard fight. Like, just like, you know, that's what BYOD is. Mean, it, it's because. People want iPads. I mean, that's really the driving factor that, that I've seen behind BYOD. If it's BYOD, if it's one of these. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's nice, at least, though, about Microsoft doing this is that you, your bullet point there, <laughs> you get, uh, their software development lifecycle for security <laughs> has greatly improved 
over the last, I want to say, six or so years, that it's, you know, it used to be that there were vulnerabilities left and right that Microsoft was releasing critical patches for on a monthly basis. They, they, it was just, you were tripping over the vulnerabilities. As a pen tester, you, you just literally had a smorgasbord of vulnerabilities that you could send out at a server and you could get in. Now, you know, people are still having to use MSO8067 as a reliable way of getting into a network. And you know, those are few and far between trying to find that type of exploit out there. Any of the more recent exploits that have been released or vulnerabilities that have been released, no one has really been able to get any stable code execution on it. Um, and I think it's really just a, it's a testament to Microsoft and how much they've really taken a hold of security and really ingrained it into their products that uh, they're releasing. Yeah, another testament to their dedication to this is paying somebody fifty thousand dollars for that Emmet Rock evasion solution that mm -hmm. failed two weeks later. But you know they still paid the money. Yeah, I mean Microsoft's taken it, it really took took light of this. I mean they really jumped into it. Uh, I mean if you look at even their other products too, that just not even just their OS products, but um, I mean the big example because I know it was a hoax that just was released today. Um, and I'm a huge gamer, but take a look at the PlayStation 3 versus the Xbox 360. You haven't seen anyone really break the Xbox 360 the way that they broke in the Sony PlayStation, the Sony PlayStation yeah, Network. PlayStation made that, the fun, the original, so. And so was the original Xbox. And I don't think that people are actually going after the Xbox like they're going after the PlayStation. It, just, you know, I'm just saying, I think if they spent the same amount of time on the Xbox and Xbox, they really got screwed just as bad. I, I don't think so. Just I don't think. I don't think it was nearly as. It wasn't so much just the PlayStation. The hardware itself was uh, exploitable, but it was also the infrastructure that they had supporting it. Um, so the PlayStation Network's websites, the the underlying protocols and stuff like that that they had that they were using to support it. It showed that Sony just kind of threw it together to get it to work, where Microsoft took the approach of trying to develop it, get yeah, right. Microsoft also charged for live access. Where oh no, oh, absolutely. So. Yeah. So they're, they're helping to fund it, but they're still taking that security, they're still having security embedded into that product as well. You know, if you've ever taken a look at trying to do any of the reverse engineering, the hardware hacking on the device, there are certificates all over the Xbox 360, and I don't think there are nearly as many certificates that you have to deal with on the PlayStation 3, uh, such, such as like the wireless controllers and stuff like that. Just the security around that even. You know, I can't even hook up a wireless controller to it. I can't make my own wireless but I, I think I can't on the PC. I don't know for sure. I don't say that for sure. But I'm just using that as an example, though, of security being embedded into, into all of their products, not just their OS. It's because they've had to take it seriously where Sony really had in the past. I mean, there's, there, there's been no reason for Sony to actually worry a ton about that where Microsoft has been and for being the, the, the largest attack so many that, times that... And for being the largest, you know, canvas out there for attack, I mean, Windows is still the operating system on everyone's computers. I mean, OS X is catching up, Linux is there, um, but I mean, Windows is still everywhere. You, know, you can't go into a program environment without finding Windows. So it is the most attacked platform out there. I think it's a testament to what they're doing security wise. They're just like not a Microsoft. <laughs> I'm not a Microsoft fan, but no, I'm not saying you are. It's good that somebody actually took up at least a little bit of the Microsoft flag because they can't be, like you said, they can't they can't be doing so horrible that you can't just blindly bash them now like you probably could years ago. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can bash them for their user interfaces and socks. Oh, dude, it's miserable. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't, I couldn't, I couldn't mention Microsoft without at least mentioning Apple because they're having their own set of issues because they quite frankly, didn't take security as serious as they probably should have. And uh, I found this, this this particular Trojan was kind of eh. Like, it, it, it's fine, it, you know, it's cool because it, uh, it'll it change itself a little bit depending on the user. I think they called it OSX Crisis, is I think what it was called. But it was it was a small one, it wasn't like a huge deal. Um, given, especially with the, the last bullet point there, it, it literally called back to one single IP address which was listed in the article. So I'm, I'm, it probably wasn't as sophisticated as some of the other stuff. But the point that it brings up, um, and specifically this one, um, reverse engineering this stuff on, on Mac 
And, and granted, I'm not, you know, you're not going to see me with Ida Pro like 24 hours a day or anything, but reverse engineering the stuff on Mac wasn't as difficult as it was on Windows because of the sophistication of the malware. And now the sophistication is actually starting to show up on the Mac a little bit more. And that got me thinking, you know, one of the things that Mac actually used to pitch was, you know, hey, don't worry about it. And they've actually taken that off their website. A lot of their marketing material has taken that away. And, you know, at this point, am I more comfortable with with the Windows software or the security development lifecycle, or am I more comfortable with Mac at this point? I almost think that I'm, I am more comfortable with what Microsoft is doing in security with their new operating systems than I am with Apple. Only because if you look at the kind of the, the history behind Apple and, and Steve Jobs and what he was really all about, granted it's going to show that I read his biography, but you know, <laughs> he was all about the user interface, all about, you know, customer doesn't really get choices. You tell them what they want and they'll love it. And, you know, that's really how Apple was brought up and how, how that company was raised. And so, in my opinion, I am probably more comfortable with what Windows is doing right now as far as security than I am with Mac. It, it, as, as only because, you know, like, like the, the points that he brought up, but also because the, um, the user base is starting to grow so much with Mac that, you know, the more people there are, the more attacks there are going to be, the more prevalent it is, you know, the more of a target you are, all that good stuff. So I don't think Mac users can feel safe anymore. And the, the really dangerous part here is that Mac users, in my opinion, are really kind of, I don't want to call them computer illiterate, but it becomes easy somehow. For, like, you know, they don't really... I just do my thing, Mac tells me what to do and how to do it, and how I get my email and how I get my Twitter and what I do on the thing, you know? When you have to populate stores that have to have geniuses that sit there and guide people <laughs> on how to use the product, you don't have that with Windows. You don't have the Microsoft bar. <laughs> yeah, everyone just doesn't know how to do yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> everyone just doesn't know how to do it and they're comfortable with that. But Mac, Apple people though, they have to go to these geniuses and these geniuses are glorified uh, geek squad people. But you know what, Josh? I'll bet you those of you who have elderly parents who are Mac users probably get less phone calls from your parents about how to do something than I get from my Windows user <laughs> yeah. parents. It's, it's yeah, try installing Linux for your parents. <laughs> it doesn't really make them more savvy either way because they have that access. But I mean, my parents have Macs, and they don't do a whole hell of a lot of that. It's just my mom to YouTube is. A hell of a thing because she doesn't have Flash installed now, so you know there's extra steps. And those wouldn't be there Windows or Mac. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's, it's just a, it's a showcase now to show you just how much of the population though doesn't really understand what's going on, and it's because it, I, I pretty much I got frustrated with my Mac and I had to sit in the Apple Store for four hours right before DEF CON because I blew up my Mac uh, purposely. Uh, but <laughs> I, I got to I got to see these people come in, the questions that they ask, and it just it took me back to to realize that I've never before saw a company that actually had to have people out there in the public eye teaching people simple things of how to use the computer and stuff like that. I mean, it's doing great. It's causing Apple to really increase their market share. Uh, you know, OS X is taking off, and so many people are. Are running to it, but it just it took me back to realize how many how many people were just technologically impaired. Oh and yeah, what they're dealing with, and it's just like I'm like these are the people that are the problem. Yeah, but that's the they're not the problem, but they're it's, these are the people that enable. They treat it like an appliance. Exactly, but at the same time, like those are the people that are going to make Mac win the Mac versus PC wars because they have an avenue for it. Yeah, and. It's going to make the Mac more have more of the iOS interface and things like that because then that'll reduce the Genius Bar load, which will then reduce the store load, which means they can just shuffle those things out by the power. We'll yeah. go farther and farther from having a PC that you can load an IDE on and do things and get closer to having an iPad, and then you just buy it from the store, mm -hmm. and then things appear there. Have you ever listened to people asking questions at Micro Center? Same thing. Oh, yeah. Used to yeah. work in CompUSA. Okay, same place. Pretty I got berated by a lady when I told her my opinion. 
And she was like, that's not right. And I'm like, you asked me which do I think is better? <laughs> I don't think you understand how this argument thing works. So yeah, I mean, one of the reasons that I chose Mac and, and I'm starting to actually thinking about going back to a Linux machine. I've had this, one thing I can say, I've had this laptop, this is one in the original 13 inch unibody Mac. I've had this thing for over four years. Not a hiccup. This thing's been rock solid. And it was able to add more memory, able to add bigger disk, because at that time you could crack your case. Obviously not anymore. But I'm actually thinking about switching back to Linux because with the new user interface and stuff like that, one of the things that I loved about the Mac was that it just it ran, I could do my stuff that I wanted to do and it stayed out of my way. Which was one of the things about Linux is, you know, you gotta get this to work, gotta get that to work, you gotta do this. And while maybe not all of it's hard, it's steps that you have to go through that are unnecessary and just annoying. So, and now with this and Mountain Lion and everything, I'm actually thinking about switching back. So the next one, I don't know if anybody's <laughs> I, this, 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 there really wasn't a lot of details on this one. But I put it in because I thought it was funny. <laughs> but um, so some malware popped up. Um, I don't know if you guys follow him on Twitter. The guy's name is Miko Hypenin. I think that's how you pronounce his last name. But everybody knows. Most people know who he is. I think he's Swedish. But he got this, um, this email from some Iranian IT person who worked at a nuclear facility saying, "Hey." Something bad just happened. We had to shut down three nuclear plants and came to find out that it was some kind of virus or malware that got onto these machines and they would just randomly play Thunderstruck. <laughs> just like blaring it out the PCs, out the speakers. So I, I just thought that was funny. We can, we can discuss the merits of the security of the US's critical infrastructure, but I, I'm more or less kind of wanting to sort of pick up the ETS. What's that? I, think, I said I think this is the best thing that whoever found this, their, their exploit, whatever, however they exploit it, I think it's the best thing that they could have done. Because how else, I mean, yeah, you could send Iran an email, say blah, 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 you know, but just having it play Thunderstruck, you know, at 2 o'clock in the morning, I mean, that's, I mean, seriously, I mean, you realize instantaneously that you have a huge problem and that you have to do something to on a different level, so. But yeah, I mean, you know. I'm not entirely sure Muslim nations are big ACDC fans, but you right. know, some of them could be. Yeah. No, they took offense when we played Metallica and Drowning for the, the last uh, Iraq war. The PSYOP screw. <coughs> <coughs> so, did anyone read that this was, this was like confirmed? Because I read something that said this was some like SANS training course <laughs> scenario like that. I, I saw I saw that Nico Hyphen his name on it and it I don't that's know usually pretty legit. Yeah. 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 Okay. So. He's, he's usually pretty yeah. reliable, I mean. But is that the best use of, you have an in and a location, do you really want to burn your your your, your one good exploit that's there? For this? Yeah, yes. Knowing it's yeah. yeah. <laughs> just to play that. Awesome. Right. Well, well, what if happens if some little <laughs> ten-year-old gets yeah. into it and presses the wrong button and you, you yeah. accidentally yeah. overload a nuclear reactor? I mean, seriously. Well, well if you're already I mean, there, that's, that's kind problem. of the goal, usually, of a lot of the things. Right. So, would you really want the chance that you'd have, if that was your goal, to blow up the reactor? Would you really want to waste it playing a, a, a wave it file? Depends on, it, depends, it, depends depends it depends on who you are. More years. Yeah. Right. It depends on who you are. If you're... They're going to send the payload of an MP3, not a wave file. <laughs> well, yeah. It's <laughs> more, but, yeah. But a wave file would definitely play. You don't always know that That's there's going to be an MP3 the player. Is, as a first attack, 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 if there's another attack going along in parallel, then this is a tracker. Yeah. 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 yeah, that could be. It's a good way to it's distract. embedded MP3. But yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're a government agency and this is legit espionage, no, probably not. But if you're somebody who found this and you're pro-American and yeah, so in the American part of America. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know. why are you picking an Australian band if you're pro-America? I mean, What's why up? would you? Why would you go with some like good old-fashioned U.S. music? Now, now we can now we can dispute music, but I don't think. Yeah, but if you're a million years, I mean, you got like three breaks. You got this Australians and one. Well, I already got the punch now. Yeah, it's just and confusion factor. No, but I. Actually, I mean, you mentioned that this might have been a SANS training exercise. Yeah. I didn't read that. 
That's it may not have been insane, but some like some, a train some article is like actually speculating that. So. Okay, so that was that was speculation that there was something to yeah, that. Yeah, I didn't read the whole. It wasn't article, like saying yeah, yeah. like that was a no. It was <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Well, I mean, if it was a training exercise, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, it's still possible. Yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly plausible. I mean, what what way to show that you yeah. compromised the computer than actually. to just have it do something that you wanted to do and play annoying American or annoying Australian rock music? Well, yeah, it's, it's just the, the bigger perfect. picture after you there too. I mean, they've had how many problems with IT infrastructure in the last 12 months? You get in there and you do this after they've done that. <laughs> it's like, okay, I think we need to evaluate something serious. <laughs> I, I, I can just like, imagine being the security after that place just being like, oh man, <laughs> <laughs> again, <laughs> really? <laughs> all right. Um, DNS changer. We've all heard about it. We know what it is. Blah blah blah. My question really around this one is how how do you guys handle these world's gonna end, you know but, yeah stuff in your in your in your own environments? Because I guarantee that you know everybody here who's works in security had some user come up to you at your job and say only in my personal life, not at work. Really? <laughs> yeah, my wife brought it yeah. up. I said, I'll yeah. see you on Tuesday. Yeah. Fine. I had several family members telling me about it, but no one at work ever. Really? Their yeah. Did anybody have somebody at work actually come up to you and say, "Hey"? Yeah, we didn't get anything either. I mean, we joke no. about it. Yeah. We looked at the wow. changer and we're like, "Yeah, we saw that." Oh, yeah. No one just. I mean, I, I would have thought that at some point you would have had a user come up to you and be like, you know. What happens on Tuesday, kind of thing, you know? <laughs> no, I haven't had that since Y2K. <laughs> <laughs> Adam asked should we had, and he ended up getting a half hour lecture on what DNS is and how it works. And he plays <laughs> over and gives lectures. So he, he never did huh. get his real explanation. Yeah, our, our, CS, our CEO might come up to our CSO and ask him, do we have to worry about this? And that's about the conversation. To one word answer, yes or no. So do you think stuff like do you think stuff like this actually hurts the the cre your credibility when there is a real thing going on? You know, something that you really, really, really no. need to worry. Users don't pay attention anyway. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they all treat it like Y two K. Everybody spent two years building up to Y two K, and most people who have a computer remember it, or their parents have told them about it, and it never happened. Like no one had any side effects from Y two K. Like the general populace saw. So every time they see the media saying, oh my god, no more internet, they're just like, yeah, okay, but I'm going to go to Facebook. So. <laughs> so, so I think you as a security professional are sensitive to it. I was too. I mean, I preemptively sent out an email to my parents and my in-laws saying, hey, by the way, in case you see this news story that's all over the news tonight, don't worry about it. And if you really want to check, here's a site you can go to to check to see if you're can I just quickly ask? I, I, I really know the story. DNS, all it does is change the DNS on the computer, right? That's all it does. You basically end up with somebody else's DNS. Yeah, it just changes the DNS server. That's it, that's it, right? Your host file. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've yeah. seen yeah. some. Yeah, I've seen some that will install like a local DNS server, and you know it will respond to that so it doesn't have to affect the host file. So, because I mean, a lot of things look for the host file as, you know, as being an infection point. Um, so the, the one that I ran into, that's what happened. It just had a local DNS server that it just called to that one instead. Hmm. And that was then redirecting out to the internet. So, so nobody really cared. <laughs> <laughs> so this article was all based around the relationship between the business and security. So, you know, obviously, you know, this one's kind of been, I don't want to say beaten to death. But everybody's heard that you know you somehow need to integrate business, integrate security into the business, make it a corporate culture kind of thing, you know, all this other stuff. Um, I, I think the the big question is, is the third one: is this a is this a battle we ever really win? Not until somebody loses money. Is it, is it one worth fighting? Not until they lose money. No, it's until they lose enough money. Well, I work for a what twelve million dollar. So, company, so it wouldn't take that much to get their attention. But, no, until, until it hits the revenue, no, it's a losing battle. Um, and, it, and honestly, I honestly thrown in the towel after the 
battle I had three months ago trying to get passwords not to be stored in the description field of the AD accounts. And kind of <laughs> <laughs> Are you freaking serious? <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh my god, do you want to have a pen test? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I want to get domain admin in the 30 seconds or less. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, and, and yeah, that's basically how it got fixed. Is well, that's that's new director, I told her I could own it in two minutes if I walked from <laughs> any machine, I could take the whole network in just a matter of minutes like that. Um, and then have to have a fight with my boss back to do something about it. Risk based decision. Yeah, no, and, and, and that's that's just one instance. I mean, we, it's 2012 and we still have allowed uh, zone transfer. <laughs> no, I, you know, I work, I work in very big government and we are still, we are not only at odds constantly with business because we interfere with what they want to try to do, but we also are at odds with other areas within technology. It's like mm -hmm. we're always just, we have to convince other areas of technology to allow us to do what we need to do for, for, to fulfill our mission. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if the battle can ever be won in some circles. I think we're, we're always a necessary evil to some extent. And like you said, until, until something happens, we're always going to be a necessary evil. You know, people, you're, you're a perfect example of yeah. Of until something happened, and when something happened, you guys yeah, we, the we benefit completely changed. We completely back. changed our culture. You know, prior, you know, the '90s, early 2000s, prior to the 2004 election cycle, <laughs> <laughs> we the security at Devolt wasn't. <laughs> we were a security company and yeah, security company, um, but we've really changed that attitude now. After you know, after we had exposures, after we had all sorts of things, after we had voting machines. Um, <laughs> We, we really changed the culture, and it took the CEO really to understand that we were there to protect the company, to protect the brand, and more importantly, protect his job. Because if we suffer anything like we had before, the CEO has full understanding he will be let go. So he knows he will be let go, hence my boss, the CSO, knows he will be let go, and so you know, we have to operate, you know, we operate with that understanding. So at the highest level, they understand. But it's the middle level, the middle management. That's where we get a lot of pushback from people. And we have the same problems. We have to fight with IT folk. We have to fight with the business. You know, they want to deploy new applications, new products. We have to fight with them to get involved and stuff like that. And we're finding that, you know, we really need to develop a better strategy of getting involved. We need to get involved with the SDLC at the beginning, at the middle, and at the end, not just at the end and say, no, you can't do that, that's bad. Because if we do that, that's where we cause the problems, that's where we make it the battle that we can't win. But if we get involved early on when they're doing the planning and say, no, you really don't want to just use a single dead key for the encryption on this, you really want to go with ADS-256. And you know, you don't really want to do this type of you know application because you don't have SQL injection. Um, that helps out a lot uh, in building the bridges with them. Because once they find out that we can become a checkbox for them, as long as they follow our instructions and follow our examples early on, they tend to work with us better and they tend to work with us more often. Uh, they come to, and then they start to come to us with problems that they have. Because then they find out that we're one of the biggest hammers they can have to quash problems. So if they have a security problem that they have, their management's not seeing it, they come report to us. We come down with the you know security hammer, problem gone. But it's it's really it's building that relationship with the people that I mean if we don't have that relationship with the people, they're not gonna care about us and they're gonna look at us as a big roadblock, a big hindrance. They don't wanna deal with us and they'll just continue to do their things, deploy their applications, deploy their hardware, however they want. So it's it's really about that networking, building the relationships, trying to work with the business at their speed as opposed to making them slow down and work with us. And unfortunately so many Security departments are understaffed, under budgeted, that it's very hard for them to work at the speed that the business wants them to work at. Um, so it takes really a, a lot of great management skills to do that. Um, so you have to have a good management at the top of your security team, and you have to have them working with the executives that understand security and understand what security brings to the company. It's actually starting to be late, so I'm going to glaze over this next one.
This one, this this is the last one I have, and this one really was kind of, I don't know, it, it definitely good for discussion because basically the, the gist of the article is that security people are spending too much time educating people and not enough time actually getting stuff done. And you see the list up here of the things that the article suggests that you should be getting done instead of educating people. Yeah, Discuss. It takes one user to click that damn link. Yep. Yeah, but. Will it ever get better? Like, as, as, a, as a company that does like social engineering pen testing, stuff like that, we, I see plenty of people like say, hey, you know what, we're just not going to, we don't want to spend budget on that because we know we're going to fail, you know? It's, it's, a, it's a lost cause and we're kind of losing there, so.